It's Wednesday, August 23rd. I'm Matt Harmon. Welcome to the Yahoo Fantasy Football Show presented by Toyota. It's a great day to talk ball and joining me to do just that. It's Dan Titus. First time on the pod. Dan, what's going on, buddy? What's up, man? I'm happy to uh, join you on the pod. Talk fantasy bus potentially well we're going to talk about it relative to adp and when you're actually drafting these guys in the rounds that they're going but um how are you feeling as a commander's guy i know you just moved back to northern oh, virginia commander's guy don't ever <laughs> never say that again i commander's guy my god i say this all the time i, I said this to andy barons over the uh, over the weekend at the fantasy football expo a couple weekends ago you know i, I grew up in the northern virginia area and like the first football i really can like you know, because there was a Joe Gibbs era and I was like, sure. you know, it's kind of I was way too young for that. Right. But like the first football I can cognizantly really remember a ton of is like the Mark Brunel, Jason Campbell, uh, Jason you know, Campbell. Washington uh, team where you know, with Jason Campbell, like checking down to 280 pound Mike Sellers as the fullback. <laughs> like that's the that's the brand of football. I first can like remember becoming obsessed with the game, which makes like no sense, by the way. I actually grew up a, a big Panthers fan because uh, my family's off from North Carolina. Okay. So um I mean, hey, there's some rough years in there, too. Let me tell you what. Uh, the, do you play the Immaculate Grid at all, uh, Dan? Uh, I Pro don't, reference but game? Uh, just seeing some of those throwback names just always has me, like, super hyped about things. Like, I, I mean, I wasn't a Panthers guy. One of my best friends is. But, uh, you know, we used to have battles in, like, 04 when Jake DeLone was actually great and, oh, and yeah. Steve Smith. Like, that was a squad. Um, and I'm trying to think of the – so your commander's days was, like, Clinton Portis and – Yes. Okay. All yes. Right. Yeah, that was that was a decent important. era. Santana Moss was really good. Oh, dude, loved Santana Moss. He was one of like my favorite receivers growing up. He was awesome. Steve Smith obviously is like the reason I do reception perception. He's right. He's the man, of course. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, they. The, I asked you about the Immaculate Grid because the Panthers came up the other day and I don't do it by myself. I do it uh, in a group chat with my buddies. We're like nice. one guy always puts it in first and then we all try to guess. I got like. The, the the Panthers ones like that so fast like oh Panthers Steelers Trey Turner oh uh, Panthers Chargers Thomas Davis somebody's like who's who are these guys I'm like don't you ever dare disrespect Thomas Davis again man like tore his ACL more times than I, I've been you know alive Dude, he was a legend linebacker legend. man legend and uh, Stephen legend. Davis was also a beast too like that was always one of my sneaker my sneaky matting guys uh way back when hundred percent. Well, listen, I would love to sit here and play guys. Remember dudes all, all day, but we do have serious business to attend to. For those yeah. who don't know, Dan, he mostly, I would say does fantasy basketball for us here. Yahoo's a, he's still a relatively new hire too. So again, first time on the pod, we send out the call to Dan, like, yo, hop on the pod here. One of these days in August, he picks conviction week and he picks busts like for the first time on the pods, so you got to respect uh, the cojones on Dan to, to jump on and just immediately trash some dudes at their ADP. We're going to do that later. We've got a great format coming up for that here as we continue Convictions Week. But first, we do have some news to get to. And speaking of the commanders, Dan joins us here on a historic day in the NFL as Baltimore's 24-game preseason win streak is officially over. They lose to the commanders. Sam Howell not a perfect outing. Guy holds onto the ball a long time, uh, but he is a playmaker. Sam Howell completed 19 of 25 passes for 188 yards and two touchdowns in the commander's preseason game against the Ravens. He also added 17 yards on three carries, which is important from a fantasy perspective. I would love to get your thoughts on Sam Howell, but also this comes at a cost uh, and it comes at a cost right to my heart. Terry McLaurin is one of my favorite receivers in the NFL. He suffers a toe injury, leaves week two of the preseason second quarter. X-rays were negative, but we later found out this morning uh, per Ian Rappaport, the commander's wide receiver Terry McLaurin is believed to be dealing with a toe sprain based on the initial diagnosis source sources say injuries from last night's game. Again, known as turf toe. Rap sheet says it's not thought to be overly serious, but he's going to have an MRI to determine the full extent. Uh, I don't like this, Dan. I don't like turf toe here for Terry McLaurin this close to the regular season. No, man, that's brutal. And um, to answer your first question regarding how I thought Sam Howe looked, um, despite him holding on to the ball for too long, I did like the mobility that I saw of him getting in and out of the pocket. He can really throw on the run. He has a little bit of zip on the ball. And I think the the chemistry that he's built with Jahan Dotson is is so evident now. And especially with that Terry McLaurin injury that could linger, turf toe is one of the worst things. That's like hamstring, you know, MCL sprain turf toe. 
that always takes down these uh, these NFL players for multiple weeks. And hopefully this isn't serious. It, it sound, doesn't sound like it's overly serious. But Mc, McLaurin did come up uh, pissed off on the sidelines. And he went to the tent. He definitely looked frustrated. So hopefully he's okay. But if he does miss any time, Jahan Dotson had seven targets, five receptions for 76 yards. He looked great. Mm-hmm. And um, I think if that chemistry is something that could go into the regular season, Jahan Dotson is a guy that certainly will not be talked about on this on this podcast. Um, but I think this is a guy that certainly could start exceeding expectations and, and his ADP as it currently stands. Yeah, we're going to probably talk a lot about Jahan Dotson on tomorrow's podcast, which has a much more rosier uh, headline to it than fantasy busts. But I'll, I'll save that. I will just say I agree with you. You know, Scott Pianowski has been saying on the pod, he doesn't want people taking Terry McLaurin. He wants people taking Jahan Dotson because he goes, you know, so much later. And Scott said there's about a 40 five to 55 percent chance that Jahan Dotson just outscores Terry McLaurin which as a I mean I love both of these dudes like I'm 100 percent in on both these guys now I think though this injury might they, that might even widen that percentage for Scott and at least for me it might get me to that percentage because I think Terry McLaurin's a top 10 NFL receiver but I think yeah. Jahan Dotson's rookie season like I had high expectations for that guy and he outkicked those again I'll save most by Jahan Dotson stuff for tomorrow's podcast because he's definitely going to be on my list for for tomorrow's episode but I agree with you And one thing just from that preseason game, you know, Dotson is a guy coming from Penn State. You saw him play with a ton of erratic quarterback play, to put it kindly. (laughs) That's a nice way of of saying it. Really comfortable, like adjusting to, to poorly thrown balls and winning contested situations. We saw that as a rookie. But what we see a lot with Sam Howell. And, and it was evident in last night's preseason game on one big catch where I think in a regular season game, Sam Howell might have got himself sacked, a strip yeah. sacked on one of these plays. But <laughs> he did get out of the play and adjust it. And John Dotson shows that like Doug Baldwin, Tyler Lockett mm-hmm. ability to, OK, my guy's scrambling. I know how to break off this route and get myself open. And that's where that chemistry comes into play that you mentioned. Right. It looked like there was a there's at least two or three broken plays that I could think of where the route was over and they just made a break and Dotson just made a break for the ball just to get open. And that, that's something you can't really teach. That's the uh, the freestyle play of it that can actually wind up getting a lot of um, down play, downfield plays. So I'm excited for Jahan Dotson. But can I ask the question, why is Terry McLaurin playing in the second quarter damn near to the first half? Like, like we don't need that. <laughs> you know who Terry McLaurin is. Like, what are we doing? Come on, commanders. I we get don't it. He's got to get his reps. But he played a full quarter. Like, yeah. I, I, I don't understand it. Maybe if I'm thinking, if I'm in Ron Rivera's head, and by the way, Ron Rivera, I think he's a good football coach, but he just like, you know, stepped on his own toes, like tripped on his own feet a couple <laughs> weeks ago with the whole Eric Bieniemy thing. Bien-Ami and this thing. is he's the Bieniemy thing. He's, yeah, but he, he used to, again, to bring back to the Panthers, he used to sure. do, you know, some stuff like this all the time where, um, like, he benches Cam for being late to a meeting, like, for, but it was just for one drive, and like Derek Anderson throws a pick on the first play. Um, he, he occasionally <laughs> yeah, I remember that honestly Rod is like just too nice he's too nice to the media he's too he like he just kind of he just kind of throws it goes off the cuff like with these guys and then he ends up doing stuff like this but then I, if I'm ju- justifying it for Ron uh, I think it's you know Sam Howell just gets named the starter they want to just get full live reps with the entire offense throw all the guys out there but it does come at a cost I hope I hope it wasn't because the the commanders guys chirped about this a little bit we want to we're going to take down the the win streak for the right, for the Ravens right. here. I, I pray that it was not like, oh, we're trying to beat the frickin Ravens, you know, the Beltway <laughs> rivalry, quote unquote, here uh, in, in the preseason. If it's that if it's for that, well, then I mean, why does Terry McLaurin have to be the sacrificial lamb? I don't know. But Ron Rivera might have been pushing uh, attempting fate on that one. Yeah, that I don't I hope this isn't a multi week injury because that's going to look really bad to start the season with that new quarterback that you're trying to get all these reps with. They're like, how can you have your star receiver sit on the sideline? So I don't know. I think it's just a cautionary tale preseason. I don't think that these starters need to be going. I know you got to do the, get the rapport up, but they shouldn't be playing into the halftime. That's that's yeah. ridiculous. Way too deep. Uh, we did see Zay Flowers as well. I just wanted to note him real quick. Caught both of his targets for 37 yards and a touchdown in the Ravens preseason game against the Commanders. Uh, I look, I love Zay Flowers. Big fan of him. Big fan of uh, Rashad Bateman as well. Obviously, Bateman and Beckham did not play. Of course, you're not going to play those guys in a preseason game, for God's sakes. Um, but Zay Flowers, man, a guy looks legit. I want to know what you think about this Ravens offense this year, man, because I mean, we don't we don't have any Ravens players coming up here uh, in, in our least favorite pick section. So 
I'm guessing maybe you're high on this offense just like I am, man. And, and Zay Flowers is a big reason. That guy's a playmaker. Um, yeah, if I'm choosing to select someone from the Ravens offense, I think Lamar Jackson in the fourth round is certainly fair. Um, the wide receiver room is a bit interesting to me because a lot of the hype has really grown around Zay Flowers. And mm -hmm. Odell Beckham obviously coming off an ACL tear, didn't play last season. How is he going to integrate into this offense? I think the reason I'm most excited about his potential as well as Zay Flowers, and probably more so Zay Flowers, is because now that the Ravens are going to be going to the spread offense that's similar to what Lamar Jackson played in college, there's going to be so many pass opportunities. Now, that could come at the expense of Mark Andrews, and part of me was actually almost tempted to call him the bust out of the just yeah. where he's getting picked, because I think he's going to be utilized a little bit differently in the spread offense. And um, But Zay Flowers is a person you can grab in the ninth round that I think is justified based off of how he's getting utilized last night. I think he's going to be heavily targeted, even though Odell Beckham and Rashad Bateman didn't play. Bateman was hurt last season, too. Both of these guys come with injury risks. I'll take Zay Flowers, who I think has a chance to prove himself. They drafted him for a reason. I think he's going to be an explosive player out the gate, so I wouldn't be scared to take him ninth round right now. You could tell me any of these three wide receivers leads the team in receiving yards wouldn't this year. and I, Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't be surprised. And that includes, I'm with you on Mark Andrews, who I don't dislike him but he goes he's the 27th overall player off the board in consensus adp top of the third round i also yeah. thought about him too but i've just felt much more conviction about the the actual guy i went with in the third round <laughs> i think we agreed in the third <laughs> round too yeah, we agreed in the third <laughs> round unfortunately uh but yeah with with mark andrews just i think he's always been the most talented player on the field for this team also considering they almost never used 11 personnel they use these two Ever. tight ends sometimes even three tight end sets like if Bateman Beckham and Zay Flowers are all healthy and I know that's kind of like knock on wood for all th for at least the top two veteran guys it, it, these guys are going to compete for targets with Andrews to the point that I think it's an open question as to who leads this team at least in 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 receiving yards and, and receptions I think with touchdowns it's probably still yeah. going to be Andrews red but, zone he's still yeah. probably going to be the guy Either way, very excited about about this offense for sure. OK, couple of news items from today. First one, Baker Mayfield has been named, uh, unfortunately, the, the QB one for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I, I don't I don't uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful to Baker Mayfield. I just listen. I, we just talked about Odell Beckham. It's hilarious that it's still like a. Or it was ever an open question as to what was going wrong with um, Cleveland and, and, and Odell Beckham. Uh, I, if you ever watched. Beckham run routes and, and play it was just clear that like Baker just doesn't work with these outside receivers who run high leverage high degree of difficulty outside routes he's also got the he's got a little bit of that Sam Howell gene but I think he's actually an, a worse athlete where he holds on to yeah. the ball too long and he like tries yeah. to scramble uh and it just like he plays like he's Kyler Murray and he's objectively not like Kyler Murray and not not even close so um just never been a big Baker guy. He had the same problem with DJ Moore, the high leverage, high degree of difficulty targets to an outside receiver. So we were talking before the show, man. I hate that. Like I have a full fade on Mike Evans. He didn't make either one of our lists just because it, at the range where he's going, it's like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to kill you. If you take Mike Evans is as, as late and late and late as he goes as a 73rd overall player, there's a guy in the seventh round that I, I actually just, I thought, but I thought about Mike Evans, man. I hate that. I said that, but it's just the Baker Mayfield factor here. Yeah, and I have no idea what to expect out of the Bucks because their offensive line is terrible. They threw for a record 700 times under Tom Brady. That's not what they're going to do with Baker Mayfield. That's not who he is. And as you said, he doesn't – he's not a complex – like he's not a go-through-the-progressions type of guy. He's a, I got out of the pocket. Oh, I got someone draped over my back. I got to make something happen. Let me just chuck it downfield. I guess that's a good thing for Mike Evans because he's a good downfield threat, but – I just can't rely on Baker Mayfield. Like, who can? How can you honestly go into draft thinking like, okay, this sounds like a good situation. Let me go get Chris Godwin and or worst case, Mike Evans. I'm avoiding both of them. And I think you're right. I was definitely tinkering him on seventh on the seventh round. I'm like, mm. but it's 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 Mike. Like, this guy's had yeah. nine straight thousand yard seasons. Like, this man's approaching Jerry Rice status here. So I got to expect if there's one person that's going to eat, it's probably Mike Evans. But I don't know that I want to pay the cost there to find out. And that's what scares me because worst case scenario, we're getting Kyle Trask. And I'm like, I don't, I don't even know how can you compare him and Baker Mayfield? Like I don't, I'm, I'm out on both of them. So I'm like, uh, yeah, I, I just got to fade Mike, Mike Evans. I, I just don't see where he's going to be a consistent viable option in fantasy this year with that erratic play at quarterback. 
Yeah, I feel like the best case scenario is we're hoping Kyle Trask does play and then that he's actually good. But that second part of it is the, is the thing I get caught. <laughs> uh, another, th- another thing that broke today, Adam Schefter reports that Seattle Seahawks first round pick Jackson Smith and Jigba is undergoing wrist surgery today in Philadelphia. Still has a chance to be ready for the start of the regular season. According to sources, surgery is going to determine how long he's going to miss. He uh, hurt his wrist Saturday night against the Dallas Cowboys. Um, Man, I love this receiver trio. This is going to hurt my bold prediction uh, on the Eckler show that uh, all three (laughs) of these guys go over a thousand yards Uh, is bold prediction for a reason. No, but I I, listen. I love this receiver core. I love the way this sets up for Geno. We we don't know how long JSN is going to miss, but I will say this. If he misses any time at all or if he gets off to a slow start this season, which I didn't think was going to happen because he's a pro ready guy. It only boosts to me DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett more. If that target tree remains highly concentrated between those two guys, we're talking about huge fantasy seasons and maybe huge starts to the season for both of these guys. Yeah, um, it didn't sound like he was going to be. Apparently, he's optimistic he can be ready for the start of the season, but there hasn't been a timetable attached to it yet. So uh, I don't know that I'm necessarily going to fade him because I think he's going to be mm-hmm. back in, in in short order. So. I, th- I liked your bold prediction. I mean, I feel like it's fair with that kind of talent um, in the receiver room for each of those guys, DK Metcalf, Lockett, and and then Jigba, Smith and Jigba, to get 1,000 yards. But it might make it a little bit more difficult now, but I would say that this, this boosts up Tyler Lockett for sure. I think he's a guy that consistently is underrated in fantasy football. All he does is produce 1,000-yard seasons and go out there and compete. So, yeah, I would move Lockett slightly up on my draft board mm-hmm. as a result if we get a, an actual timetable because I think that that's just going to funnel more targets between him and DK Metcalf, which is great for for their fantasy values. And Geno Smith is also still getting disrespected in fantasy, but 100%. Um, but that's, a, that's another story for another day. Last thing here, Jonathan Taylor was given permission by the Colts to <laughs> seek a trade. We're going to put a pin in this because, uh, spoiler alert, unfortunately, Jonathan Taylor is going to come up here in our next segment, but just want to acknowledge, we know that that's in the news. It's a pretty big story, but we, again, we'll put a pin in Jonathan Taylor and get back to that. We're actually going to take a quick break here. After the break, we continue Convictions Week on the podcast by identifying our least favorite picks in each round of the draft. All right, Dan, let's get into it. This is... No, this is no fun. Okay. You know, fantasy busts, whatever. I'm going to couch this a little bit by saying the exercise I want us, I wanted us to do here was to go through each round in consensus ADP. Uh, four for four has got a great tool for this. Uh, it, it brings an in entire industry ADP because listen, there are some guys, Tyler Lockett, great example. My buddy James Coe was, was making fun of me the other day that if you look at Tyler Lockett's ADP, across the industry you'll see him going as low as 87 on some sites and then as high as 47th overall uh, on yahoo and it's like hmm, i wonder i wonder who who's who's dragging up that uh <laughs> who's, who's that standing yahoo in rating. there i don't know yeah who could it be? Hard, hard to say so that just goes to show that across the industry there are different adps uh you know th- throughout wherever you're drafting so this consensus tool does a good job of this this is the one we're working off of here look we're not going to sit here and slam these dudes, right? And, and it's just picks that we're kind of – when we're on the clock, Dan and I, these are guys I think – is it fair to say we're just like, you know, we find ourselves not clicking these guys at ADP very often. If they slide to certain, you know, areas, that's fine. But right now where they're going, it's just guys we're kind of drafting around. Right. And, and I would say that we've participated in, what, four mock drafts together? And for yes. some reason, we keep on getting – uh, pinned up against each other or like right really behind. Have, I don't dude. know. I'm what always is, drafting around. What is you, up so. with that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like it though because it's, it's making me sharper, but it is also like I get sniped a lot. But I can also say that many of the people that we're going to talk about today have not ended up on either of our teams. So I feel like we're consistent about us fading these people relative to where they're going in drafts. Yes. And the great part about that, listeners, if you disagree with us and you actually really love these guys at their ADP, you think they could even exceed the ADP. Number one, you get to draft your own teams. You control your own destiny. So that's wonderful. But also, Dan and I are clearly putting our money where our mouths are. So if these guys uh, end up burning us on this podcast, you can take joy in the fact that not only were you right and we were wrong, we also got burned along the way, too, because we take our own advice here. So let's get it started, Dan, with our least favorite picks in round one. As the guest, I will let you reveal your one first. Oh, so kind, so kind. So the first person that I would not draft in round one is Saquon Barkley. I know that he got paid an extra $900,000 in incentives and he signed his tender. 
But this man is not happy. He can't be. What running back is actually happy right now? Like, at this point, how can you trust in a guy that saw 290, uh, what do you have, 352 touches last year? Now, there's been some research done on running backs that have seen over 300, uh, 350 touches, 400 touches in a season. But over the last five years, uh, excuse me, over the last three seasons, there's been six players that have gone over 350 touches. All of them had down years the following year. And guess who had that last year? Saquon Barkley. Now, he did have a beastly year his rookie season. He followed that up with another good season. But I just can't justify paying um, a first-round value on Saquon Barkley when, I don't know, I just feel like the running back market with such volatility there, I think he's still frustrated. I think there's a chance that, I'm not, you know, knock on wood, things happen. I think he has much more to play for. And why put your body out there for another 350 touches if you don't have to like and they can franchise them again so I just think it's a it's a muddy situation that I want no parts of and there's another running back that I'm going to talk about too who's also in a contract dispute right now that I think is not worth the risk of drafting you can pick other players around that spot where Saquon is going you can get a high-end wide receiver who's already been paid don't have to worry about the drama and they don't get hurt as frequently so I just think Saquon Barkley initially is is a pass for me in round one you know when we first pulled up this list I was thinking, you know, I, I don't mind Saquon Barkley in the first round, but I look at my running back rankings and like I've got tier one at running back is CMC and Austin Eckler. I think those guys are on a tier to themselves. They're they're the only running backs. They're the only non wide receivers I'd consider in the first five picks of a non super flex draft. Obviously, if it's super flex, you can you can throw some quarterbacks in there, too. But for me, those two guys are kind of clearly at the top. I like Nick yeah. Chubb. I've got him at three. I've got Derrick Henry at four. Uh, I've got uh, another running back who, oddly enough, I'm about to talk about next at running back five. <laughs> and then like Tony Pollard and, and I've got Saquon Barkley at seven. And, and my concern with Barkley, I like that you bring up the holdout stuff. And, and it's not that we're concerned about these guys missing the start of the season because ultimately push comes to shove. I think all these guys are there in week one. Yeah. My concern, Dan, is, you know, Saquon Barkley, he's had an injury history before. All these guys, I mean, every running back has some level of an injury history, but if he gets like a, a minor injury that he could push it through, does he slow it down a little bit? I tend right. to doubt he's wired that way, but it's just sort of it's something you got to think about, right, with these guys. Uh, and lastly, though, the the real just team construction part, Saquon Barkley led the Giants with 76 targets last year. The second guy was Darius Slayton at 71 targets. I think he could have a similar rushing base season as he did last year, but those 57 catches are, are we kind of, and by the way, it wasn't even like the most explosive receiving season in the no. world either. And I think that kind of goes to show where he's at as a receiver at this point. Anyways, he's not an, a CMC type runner routes, you know, a, across the formation type of guy at this point. Is he going to get those 76 targets again? Now that Darren Waller's in the mix, you know, they added a ton of receivers there. Isaiah Hodgins kind of stepped up. Darius Slayton's back on a new contract. That's where I'm really concerned uh, with Saquon Barkley this year. Yeah, I think that that's fair. And, you know, I think Daniel Jones is, is one of the players that I've actually been more interested in. I think he's going to have some maturation in his past Same. work this year. Now that he actually has more weapons, um, they may not be as reliant on Saquon Barkley and um, or at least in the past game specifically. So, yeah, I think that there's just a couple of things that just bring me a little a little bit more risk in the first round that I feel like you could just dodge that bullet and find someone else that may not give you so much of a sweat on a week to week basis. My running back, it's a it's a running back, the guy I don't like in the first round. And I I don't like this one. I don't like that I'm 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 going with this one, but it's Bijan Robinson uh who right now is going off the board. I should have mentioned Saquon Barkley is the 11th player off the board uh overall. Bijan Robinson is actually going ahead of him, and I agree Bijan should be going ahead of uh Saquon Barkley. He's the 8th overall player, uh the fir- the 8th pick in the first round. Yo, I, I love Bijan Robinson. I am all in on the Falcons offense. I just feel like he's a little bit more to me, a guy that I don't often click at that height for Bijan Robinson. I'm kind of comfortable with him at the turn. I'm kind of comfortable with him, certainly in the early part of the second round. I think all of these guys that I mentioned, uh, Derek Henry, Bijan Robinson, Tony Pollard, Saquon Barkley. Those are all guys that I think are great second round picks. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I'm struggling a little bit with the first round part. And the reason I'm struggling is that I do think Tyler Algier is going to play a legit role. And maybe this age is, you know, like garbage. OK, but I think that, that Tyler Algier plays a legit role, has like 150 something carries this year. And they use Bijan in these really fun and awesome ways. 
for the Falcons offense as a receiver, but it doesn't necessarily breed consistent week to week, like top five running back numbers. And again, he's the RB three. He's the RB three right now. And I'm, I'm not even going to sit here and say like, you never played it down in the NFL. I don't care about that crap. That's not real, <laughs> but how many touchdowns are the Falcons scoring overall? How good is this offense going to be from that angle? And he's got to compete still with Drake London and with Kyle Pitts for targets overall. I even think Matt Collins is going to have more targets than people want to admit. So for me, I'd ra- again, I'd rather take Nick Chubb. I'd rather take Derrick Henry uh, than B. John Robinson. And those guys are both going well later than him in drafts. Yeah, I was having this conversation with a, a close friend of mine about like how high would you take B. John? And I'm looking at my RB rankings and like, I think I like Bijan more than Derrick Henry this year, just given the age and the mileage, the the wear and tear. And, but I haven't found a point where I've been willing to take him right after Nick Chubb. I haven't yeah. done it yet. And it's, I think it's just the price. Like I, again, I've just been going wide receiver heavy in the first round and with so much value in the third and fourth rounds at running back, I'm usually the guy that's waiting for those, you know, next tier down guys, because I don't want to spend the cost of investing in the Atlanta Falcons, a very bad division, which could net some fantasy points. But what's Desmond Ritter going to look like in year two? And Tyler Algier was not a scrub last year. He ran for over a thousand yards. He had 4.9 average, 4.9 yards per carry. He has to have some involvement. Like they're just not going to just give it all to Dijon. Like he still has, sure. He gets 70% of the workload. Okay. I don't know that I, I, I this the price is just a little bit too high for me that I've been willing to pull it. So I understand why you have Bijan there, but I do think that he could if he somehow falls in your drafts to the end of the first round or early second auto pick right there. Yeah, exactly. Even Cordero Patterson, who I know is banged up right now, but he he when he's on out the out there, he's going to get involved a little bit in some of yeah. these cool receiver ways that we want uh, to see for Bijan Robinson. So like guys, I'm taking ahead of Bijan without question, Justin Jefferson, Christian McCaffrey, Jamar Chase, uh, Austin Eckler, who I mentioned, I, I think I'm taking Kelsey, even though I don't love, you know, the age that he's at, but I think I'm taking mm-hmm. Kelsey over Bijan. I think I'm taking Tyreek, Cooper Cup, Same. Steph Diggs, Nick Chubb, um, CD lamb and AJ Brown. I think I, I'd take ahead of him and that, you know, is before you even get to like, Derrick Henry, who I think it's a little bit of a push with him yeah. and, and Bijan, but again, that's a lot of players, and it it just comes down to somebody likes Bijan in the room more than me, basically every single right. time, even though I like the player quite a lot. Um, exactly. Give me your round two guy that you are drafting around. Yeah, so my round two guy has got to be Josh Jacobs, and he's, I mean, coming off a monster season, led the league in rushing yards, scrimmage yards, 12 touchdowns. This man racked up 393 touches. And right now he said that he's going to report he's going to end his holdout, but he hasn't really given an indication of when he actually plans to actually sign on the dotted line. And until he does, I just can't go into the drafts of the second round value and pick him. Like, I don't know that I want to mess with this situation. The Raiders were not a good team last year. Three of their offensive linemen graded below average per PFF. And even though he had a monster season, Jimmy Garoppolo is playing quarterback. I don't know. I'm just not that thrilled about what the outlook of the Raiders looks like. And you already have a disgruntled back. The franchise already didn't offer him a fifth year option. To me, this just sounds like pettiness. And I don't want any part of the nonsense that's going on with the the contract disputes. I would hope that Josh Jacobs decides to come back and and play, play the way that he did last season. But with that kind of mileage, you know, 393 touches is a lot. And what I re- referenced before, again, that over that 350 mark, I feel like it's going to be hard pressed for him to repeat what he did last year. And you're certainly getting him at his ceiling when you're drafting him this high. A lot of it, too, uh, when you look back at how they and I, I talked about this with Eckler on the last episode, the, a lot of the ways that Jonathan Taylor just had these like light boxes was because of the presence of Devontae Adams. And, and you're still mm-hmm. going to get that right. As long as Devontae is out there, you're dedicating extra. You're not bringing a guy into the box and leaving. Uh, Devonte Adams with that like just no. single man coverage on the outside mm-hmm. you're not going to do that um, however unless like Jimmy Garoppolo is not pushing the ball downfield a, a ton like that really becomes a problem they could sort of squat on this team and that would make it a little bit more difficult for Josh Jacobs to have that sort of like extreme efficiency that he did last year I did recently flip Josh Jacobs ahead of the guy that I'm going to talk about here is my least favorite pick in the second round. And it is Jonathan Taylor, who we mentioned at the top uh, was given quote, given permission to seek a trade by the Indianapolis Colts. Stephen Holder uh, of ESPN, who's been 
covering this team for a long time, has been all over this Jonathan Taylor situation, said that the Colts want a first round pick back. This is very similar. Yeah, okay. So he's not getting, number cool one, he's not getting saying. traded. Yeah. <laughs> he just dogs uh, him in the public, and he's like, oh, by the way, give me a first-round pick for him because he's so great. Like, who well, is this this is, a, this is exactly the situation that Austin laid out that happened with him, which yeah. was they don't want to extend him. They don't want to give him a pay raise, but they are going to demand way too much because they see the value to the team right now because he's under contract. Mm-hmm. So they're going to demand way too much in order to to get that trade done. Because uh, again, this is not only are you trading for Jonathan Taylor in this hypothetical situation, you're also committing to giving him the contract that he wants. Like you can't just trade for him and be like, yeah, go out and play for us now on this little cheapy rookie deal because that's clearly not what he wants. So I don't think he's going to get traded. So let's exist right now in the world that he's on the Indianapolis Colts. And again, we've got a disgruntled running back who is not happy with the team that he's playing on right now. Uh, so again, if Jonathan Taylor suffers an injury, is he going to gut this thing out for the Indianapolis Colts? By the way, Jonathan Taylor is dealing with an injury right now. Uh, like This isn't a hypothetical. This is what's happening currently in the moment. And that leads me to be alarmed that he dealt with this uh, kind of nagging an- ankle injury all last season. It's hard to parse what's real and what's not because of the contract stuff. But Right now, he is dealing with it currently. I don't love drafting guys that are coming into the year with an injury like this, especially at the running back position. And then third thing here, Dan, is that John Taylor is not going to catch passes most likely from Anthony Richardson. He's going to have to deal with Anthony Richardson stealing kind of rushing attempts at the goal line. So there's a lot of red. There's there are some red flags that maybe I could look past uh, if Jonathan Taylor wasn't dealing with this contract situation. But because he is it makes him a a pretty rough pick in the second round. But I will pose this question to you. I don't think he's going to get traded, but I want to sort of brainstorm here. If he did, are there any teams that he would go to uh, or maybe give me three teams that he would go to that you're like, all right, never mind. Now I'm willing to throw out all caution to the wind and I'm taking Jonathan Taylor and he's one of my favorite picks in the second round. So there's a a couple on my brain. Uh, Miami would be certainly interesting. Yes, that would that would be an explosive offense that I'm sure Mike McDaniel could figure out a way to utilize that running back. And uh, and Tua's was not going to vulture TDs at the goal line for sure. I feel like Howie Roseman would just throw it in there just because that's Howie Roseman. Like he's always curious about what's what's out on the market. And somehow yeah, he but figures like, out a way not, to do it. They're not, uh, d- but they're know, not they're sending not real resources for a running back, right? Like, no, yeah, he no, would totally he would come in there and like kick all those other dudes to the curb. But yeah. I would say like one team that maybe this is not a realistic one, but could the Chiefs right the wrong of taking Clyde Edwards Alaire in the first round over Jonathan Taylor because that was the same draft, right? Um, that at least is interesting. I could see, look, this is a team that is, could win the Super Bowl every single year. Um, I think the problem with them is that this is why it's so kind of perplexing. I get why the Colts don't want to get give anybody a contract right now. Like They're not extending anybody, okay? like no. That's the way they're looking at it. Jonathan Taylor included, even though I think he's been their best player, certainly on offense the last couple of years. This would be the right window to do it, right? Like you have Anthony Richardson on a rookie contract. You sign him to, you sign Taylor to a mega extension. By the time he's aged out of that extension, then it's time to hopefully, if it all works out, give money to Anthony Richardson. That's sort of the problem here where like, I, I don't think any any other team has, has that like rookie contract window, except the Dolphins, which is why it's a great one to bring up. Yeah, I thought the Cowboys kind of came to mind. Like, I feel like Jerry Jones would probably try to make a splash like that. Oh, God. Um, but I don't know if Did they have imagine? the con- I don't know if they have the I don't know if they have the cap flexibility slash uh, draft capital to make it happen. But I'm sure he's going to inquire about it. Yeah, uh, I think. Look, I've seen that that bandied about for sure. Yeah, you just look at teams that like have cap space right now. Like the Colts are up there. The Colts, I think, are are sixth in the NFL in cap space. Like they the Cowboys do have a decent cap number, but they got to worry about paying like Micah Parsons and CD yeah. Lamb. They just mm-hmm. paid Trayvon Diggs. They probably ought to extend I mean, I know a bunch of Cowboys fans don't want to hear it, but they probably should extend Dak Prescott to to keep that window open. So it's really tough to it's it's like tough to to find a fit. Maybe the New England Patriots. They got $15 million in cap room, and, and they'll just throw funny money around. The Bears, I guess the Bears are one to bring up, uh, though I think Khalil Herbert's kind of giving them what they're looking for. So, it, yeah, there's there's not many great what landing spots. and Vikings? Yeah, they're they're in a little – I mean, they're okay, like $10.5 million in cap room. That's not the worst thing to suggest if they just haven't really seen what they've wanted to out of, out of Alexander Madison. But they – and they certainly – I. 
think are probably moving on from Kirk next year because he's in the last year yeah. of his deal and they can't franchise mm-hmm. tag him. So actually, that's not a that's not a bad one to bring up. I think it would just be an interesting from a fantasy perspective having him and JJ together. That would be oh, yeah. pretty dynamic offense there. That's sort of the exact same thing we painted with the Raiders, where like you are dedicating extra attention to Justin Jefferson on right. every single snap. You're not bringing an extra guy in the box to defend that run game. So that's actually mm-hmm. an interesting one uh, to bring up. But again, I feel like all of this is meaningless because he's probably not getting. <laughs> so <laughs> let's move to the third round. And we actually are in consensus here. Both of us listed Steelers running back Najee Harris as our least favorite Third round pick for context. He goes off the board as the 29th overall player, the fifth pick in the third round. Dan, tell us why we don't like Najee Harris at that ADP. Um, I think it's been pretty clear. I mean, he's the bell cow back. He will probably continue to be that under Mike Tomlin, but he's just not an efficient running back. And um, I, I think at a certain point, he's another guy that's been heavily utilized over the last couple of years. And I think it's more about what I've seen out of Jalen Warren that they just can't deny anymore. I think that they're going to spell him more than they have in the past because they want him to be able to make it. Like he's been pretty durable for the first two seasons of his career, but how long does that last? And you have an explosive running back behind you to kind of, you know, eat into some of the, that workload a little bit and not have to put so much additional wear and tear on the tires. And, you know, I think Kenny Pickett um, is looking better this season Um, their offense looks better. Their offensive line is slightly more improved, but I don't know that it's enough that I'm willing to trust that Najee Harris is going to get over, just become a different running back, an efficient one that still gets the volume. Like if you're drafting him at three Oh five, you're really getting the guy that has all of the volume, but the advanced metrics aren't kind to Najee Harris. And, and I would, I think that there's just better options that you can have that might be uh, more fruitful in the third round there. Honestly, I don't really like, many of the running backs in this round you know you've got Najee Harris Ramondre Stevens is the one I I have ranked the highest and I do like taking I'm fine with Joe Mixon like Jameer Gibbs makes me a little nervous as the 11th pick in the third round Travis Etienne a little nervous as the ninth pick in the third round but the fact that Harris goes ahead of all these guys I can easily make the case that he should be ranked below all of them and I yeah yeah I do the inverse put him in the in the back end of the third and then I'd be a little bit more okay with it probably yeah, there's just a lot of red flags here, and it does come back to Jalen Warren, who's not going to take his job. No. Right. No. But I, I saw this from Seth Walder of ESPN that uh, when you look at their receiver tracking metrics, the overall score last year, the top three receiving backs, Christian McCaffrey, Austin Eckler and Jalen Warren was three, which I do think Warren is a pretty good player. I and mean, he brings he ripped off that big preseason run, which he just he has juice and he brings a yeah. dimension that, like you said, they can't really deny at this point. Even if he's the third down back, even if he's used in like hurry up situations, taking those away from Najee, who we need to get all the volume. You know, this is a guy who had 94 freaking targets in his first year and then 53 last year. I think we could see yet another trend down in Mm -hmm. targets because if you're Kenny Pickett, who it's crazy that I like all of the receivers in I, I like every pick basically for the Pittsburgh Steelers, except the guy that goes first off the board here, Najee Harris. If you're dropping back and you're Kenny Pickett, and it's just you're going through your reads. You're going to look to Deontay. You're going to look to George Pickens. You're going to look to Pat Fryermuth. Fryermuth. Like mm-hmm. you might even look to like Alan Robinson or Calvin Austin as like the role players before you get to Najee in the pecking order. So like I think a 20 catch season is in the range of outcomes for Najee Harris. And in that case, you need him to a be hyper efficient as a runner and b score like 13 touchdowns. And I'm going to mm-hmm. probably doubt that either one of those happen. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, this the the varying role that I'm, I'm thinking that the the Steelers are going to have for him is certainly going to suppress some of the value that we that you're expecting in getting a, the third pick and the the fifth pick in the third round. Um, I just I just think his numbers are going to go down this year. So yeah, common theme. I just don't like the guys that are getting super high workloads going into the following season, man. And uh, Najee fits that bill, so I'll pass. All right, give me – you got another running back here as your least favorite pick in the fourth round. I must really hate running backs or something here. <laughs> yeah, real running yeah. back hater. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brees Hall. So I know he's off the pup list, and that's all well and great. It does concern me that the coaching staff did say that they're going to bring him along slowly, and then they go out and sign Dalvin Cook. And Dalvin Cook isn't washed yet as much as fantasy Twitter wants to make it seem like he is. You know, he – saw like the six most red zone targets Um, while Brees Hall and Dalton is very adamant about the elusiveness and the breaking tackles and, 
you know, Brees Hall has all these advanced metrics before he got injured that he was a mm-hmm. stud, a like great running back. But Dalvin Cook is going to give you competition, no matter how you slice it. And so whether he, whether the season progresses and he comes on more and maybe he takes some of that workload back, that's, sure, that's certainly fair. I don't know that I want to pay for that in the fourth round when I can get a running back that can get, that is an RB1, no doubt, that won't have any kid gloves on him for a portion of the season. And the Jets offensive line, if you're watching Hard Knocks, not very good. And <laughs> they had some struggles there. So, you know, as good as this team is and can be offensively, um, the running back by committee kind of kind of gives me a little bit of, of tension that I don't want to risk right now in the fourth round. That just seems a bit high. And Brees Hall is going uh, where in the fourth round? He's going... He is the 41st four so, overall play. Right. Yeah, 405. Mm-hmm. So that's that's uh that's expensive for a guy that's gonna have you know an all pro running back stepping into the running back room there. Yeah, uh it's it's problematic for sure. I like Brees Hall a bit more as a fifth round pick, and and he might start to slip there more and more as we get closer to like drafts around Labor Day. I think he's right. perfectly fine there. I, I do think if you are looking at your team as one that you are feeling better about the players on your roster kind of getting off to a hot start. Like maybe you take Jamal Williams later. You can kind of live with Brees Hall and maybe get that upside in the second half of the season. But you are definitely banking on him. I think you're banking on his receiving ability, which I've said is like sort of prime David Johnson. He's the only one who you could compare like the air yards that he was getting per target last year Mm -hmm. is like what David Johnson was doing at his peak. Um, So, but that's a lot to bank on. I think Aaron Jones, who obviously played with Aaron Rodgers last year, it's a great comparison. Like Aaron Jones was the ninth, overall fantasy back last year, but he scored two rushing touchdowns. He averaged 5.3 yards per carry and he caught five touchdowns as a receiver on 59 catches. Like you're basically banking on if Brees Hall is going to kind of outkick his ADP where he's going, you're banking on that sort of efficiency, which is a little bit of a tough ask when obviously last year, the Packers receiver court didn't have a a superstar in a guy like Garrett Wilson, who I do think is going to take that leap this year. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, Dalvin Cook, though, also didn't have a, a bad season receiving. He had his third yeah, highest yeah. reception total and, and target. So I, Dalvin's a hell of a back, man. I just feel like this is going to muddy the waters for for any fantasy manager. But I do like the prospects as the season wears on. Maybe that's a guy you trade for. But I also like your your um, strategy of, hey, let me get somebody that can just fill the void for the first three or four weeks and then like a Jamal Williams um, with the Alvin Kamara suspension. I think that's a really savvy move if you're going to invest them in a fourth round value. All right, guy, I don't like in the fourth round, and I hate this. I hate that I'm going to throw this name out there. Sixth player going off the board in the fourth round, 42nd overall. It's Chargers receiver Keenan Allen is wide receiver oh. 19. I, yo, dude, I, I love Keenan Allen. I He's one of like my favorite, I think, most underrated superstar receivers of the last decade. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing. We have clearly seen a decline in his game. In reception perception, for those people who don't know, it's the receiver charting uh, work that I do at receptionperception.com. From 2015 to 2020, this guy was one of the most steady and most consistent and best players at beating man coverage. He followed, he filed anywhere between 77.6% success rate versus man and 76.6%. I mean, very consistent. All of those seasons was right there. And those are, you know, near elite, if not elite numbers at beating man coverage. In 2021, we saw him dip down to 74.2. And last year, we saw him fall way off the map to 66.9%, which isn't bad. But it's a big decline in his game. I typically, with these guys at receiver, if there's like that sort of slip, you start seeing it. I kind of want to be a year early getting off the board, uh, getting off the boat with these guys. That's kind of where I'm at with Keenan Allen. Plus, like they've got Quinton Johnson. They've got Mike Williams. These are guys that are going to win downfield. We want this offense to be more downfield focused. Either Here's the thing that's not going to happen, Dan. Either uh, Eckler is going to be a disappointment at ADP because he's not going to catch the passes that he did last year and be involved as a receiver. Or Keenan Allen's not going to have this like insane target share that he did when he got back last year. And because if those two things do happen, we're going to be complaining about Justin Herbert's average depth of target again, just like we were last year. Because like you're not feeding a guy who I think primarily has to run out of the slot at this point and you're pass catching running back over a vertical X receiver and a guy in Quinton Johnson who's pretty explosive, even if he's got some work to do as well. So um, just I hate it. This is the first year I haven't clicked Keenan Allen once in drafts and, and I don't like it. See... 
that's interesting because I found him to be the value of most drafts right now because he's yeah, falling. I'm like, hey, I'll take Keenan Allen here. But I'm also understanding where I'm getting him and where my my team is stacking up here. He's usually my he's my depth. I'm not drafting him as a wide receiver one, not wide receiver two. He's probably my wide receiver three. I'll plug him into the flex when I need to because I do see that decline. You're right. The touchdowns, you know, he's usually a six touchdown guy each season, but that was four last year. There are injury concerns a little bit there. Um, but now it's just the, the wide receiver room got that much deeper. And I think before you could rely on Mike Williams missing a handful of games. Well, if you spend a pretty considerable draft pick on Quentin Johnson there, um, that's that's for a reason, right? And, and Austin Eckler is certainly very involved in the pass game. Herbert is not afraid to dump it off in, in that low A dot. So I don't know. I think that there's room for him in PPR league still. I think he'll still generate enough targets that it's worth it. But half PPR without those touchdowns, I'm less interested in Keenan Allen at cost. But I yeah, still think I, he can make for a solid wide receiver three if you go wide I, receiver heavy in your first few rounds. Yeah, I don't think he's going to kill you. I just don't think he has like I think other people think he's got a lot of upside, even at this depressed cost. I don't think he yeah. has that at this point anymore. So if you want to mix in that floor guy and he falls below, like if he falls to the fifth round, I'm okay with it. But just where he's going, is a little too much for me. All right. As we enter round five here, I think these, this is where we're going to have a little more conviction with these guys where it's like, yeah, yeah, we, we, at least to me, that's how I felt. I, I felt much more strongly about avoiding these guys than I did some of the players that we listed in the, listed in the first four rounds. So you give me your round five guy that you are drafting around. Round five. So I've been doing a, a weekly ADP market report um, over the last month, and one name has consistently shown up week after week, and that's DeAndre Hopkins. I don't know that he's going to continue to stay in the fifth round, but whoever's drafting him in the fifth round, don't do it. Um, <laughs> there's just so many red flags with the, te- the Tennessee Titans. Uh, Ryan Tannehill, another year older, not a, a, an explosive or dynamic passer by any means. With Derrick Henry, such a run-heavy approach, I don't think that DeAndre Hopkins really fits here. Traylon Burks is hurt. Maybe he is more valuable initially, depending on how long Burks is going to be missing that injury with the LCL injury. But I'm just fading DeAndre Hopkins. I just don't see where the value is in the fifth round. Uh, If if he falls way later than that, sure, I'll take him as as wide receiver depth. But, you know, I'd be much more comfortable if, if Keenan Allen fell in the fifth round than selecting like a DeAndre Hopkins. Um, just don't see it. Not the system, uh, the role, uh, coming off an injury, uh, coming off a suspension year where he kind of was all right with the with the Cardinals. I don't know. He's, he's another year older. Fade, yeah. I'm, I'm fading DeAndre Hopkins. I just don't see it at fifth round. Yeah, he's another guy that was elite, elite at beating man coverage in 2019 and 2020. Was, but we did see a decline in 21 and 22 for DeAndre Hopkins. And some of that was injuries, obviously the suspension as well, which for, was for uh, steroids. So there is that performance yeah. enhancing drugs or whatever. So you can maybe think there's something there. Um, weirdly enough, like I have DeAndre Hopkins ranked at wide receiver 23 and he goes off the board at wide receiver 23. But hmm. there are... At least I'm you know, one, two, three, four, five guys that go behind him in drafts that I have ranked ahead of him. So weirdly, like, and maybe that means I'm skeptical of some of the other guys, which I'm about <laughs> to talk about here. <laughs> but there are guys that I just have ranked behind him that I would rather take. So I haven't been taking a lot of Hopkins either, even though I'm with you. I think he get like 40 targets in the first uh you know, three weeks of the season mm-hmm. with Burks banged up. Kyle Phillips is also dealing with an injury too. Um, so there is that. The guy in the fifth round for me, it's another receiver. It's Jerry Judy. And I mean, listen, if you're new to the yeah. podcast, you might not have heard this, but if you're uh if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you understand where I'm at with Jerry Judy. Number one, I think he's uh not a consistent player. Uh I don't think the route running uh reputation that he came into the NFL with which which he was a good collegiate route runner he has not progressed and developed in that area like the people that call him a great route runner are still leaning really heavily on a practice videos which I mean give me a break and b um (laughs) the the college reputation and the college player profile I'm also concerned too like uh, Jerry Judy by the way is the first player off the board in the freaking fifth round He's the 49th overall player off the board, wide receiver 21. I have him ranked as a wide receiver 31. That's a 10 spot gap there. He's a guy that I think if you're taking him in that volatile wide receiver three, you know, guys that like, okay, I th- he's my flex. 
uh, I, I can I can surround him with the safer receiver court. He gets those high ceiling weeks because those big play weeks are going to happen. That's kind of he's more of like a big play merchant, a, a splash big play merchant than he is a consistent route runner. You're also you number one I have to if to, to like Jerry Judy here, if to disagree with my player evaluation on him, which is fine. It's your right to do. You also have to I think you have to believe Russell Wilson bounces back for him to be the 21st overall player or the, the 49th player. Uh, over our overall off the board, Dan, because there's a lot of other guys that are going to compete for targets here. Cortland Sutton, Marvin Mims, like Greg Dulcich, I know has a, a weird role, but they're going to throw to their backs. And then, man, yo, like they're not going to throw the ball a lot. They're going to run the ball. They're going to be play really slow with uh, this team. That has been clear. So to me, I think Jerry Judy is a total avoid at this ADP. If he falls a couple rounds later, I, I like him, but he never does. No, he never does. And I, I think most people are probably draft him off the strength of, oh, the wide receiver room isn't that deep. Um, Tim Patrick got hurt and Cortland Sutton um, hasn't had the best injury history either, but neither has Jerry Judy. So, yeah, yeah. I, I I do have a couple of shares of Jerry Judy, but it usually has been around the sixth round. So I don't think we're too far off, but I do agree with you. There's just other wide receivers that I would prefer around that area, you know, the Drake Londons, the Christian Watsons, even Brandon Ayuk and Tyler Lockett, I feel yep, like are 100%. more sure bets to outperform their ADP than drafting Jerry Judy right there. So uh, I, I hear you on that. I'm not as down on him as you are. Like I would definitely be, I would be okay with him as my wide receiver too, maybe, but I, where he's going is a little bit too high. I never usually get him anymore. Uh, all right, we're going to get a little faster here around six through 10 uh, before we just list some names off for 11 to 15. So we'll just you just give me your reason for uh, each guy. I'll give you mine and we'll just kind of kick this into high gear. So give me round yeah. six. Who's your least favorite pick here? Round six, Deshaun Watson. Why? Uh, there's several <laughs> yeah. other quarterbacks you can get right after Deshaun Watson that are better and going to be better than Deshaun Watson. He just doesn't look like the same guy. And I know it takes time, but I'm not interested in anybody on the Cleveland Browns offense that is not named Nick Chubb. Right now, he's QB 10. I think he should be probably QB 14. I would pick Aaron Rodgers before him. I would pick Tua Tagovailoa over him. I would pick Daniel Jones, who just slid into QB 9 on Yahoo's latest rankings. So if you're going to wait on quarterback, I would just wait for... I'd rather have Anthony Richardson. Um, yeah. So I'm just out on Deshaun Watson. Don't like the fit. Don't like the receiver room. This is Nick Chubb's team, so I'll, I'll draft Nick Chubb, but no one else. I'm not as down on Deshaun as you. I have him at QB9. He goes as QB9, but in the six, I'm not taking him in the sixth round. Like, So it's just more of an overall board mm -hmm. perspective there. I've got Rashad White to bring it back to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I get it. He These are the type of backs you want to avoid. Like You're not sure how good they are, and based on Rashad White's rookie season, it was a little questionable from an efficiency standpoint. I know he caught a lot of passes. He's not going to catch those passes with Tom with, with Tom Brady not in the mix here. He goes off the board uh, as the 11th pick in the sixth round, running back 25. I mean, it's just like that's that's whatever. But these volume based argument backs, I think you probably want to avoid here. So I'm not taking Rashad White in the sixth round. Who are you not taking in the seventh round? Evan Ingram. I know he just got paid, but Calvin Ridley's back, baby. And uh, there's not going to be enough mouths to feed. Um for Evan Ingram to have the season that he had last year to draft him in the seventh round. Um, I would be okay with drafting. I know you're high on Pat Fryermuth and and he's going around later. So yep. why pay the seventh for Evan Ingram, who's facing a ton of competition when Kenny Pickett's proven to have a strong chemistry with Fryermuth, And I much prefer him um, over, over Evan Ingram. So yeah, I would pass on him in round seven for sure. We are on the same page there uh, with that one. I have in the seventh round, I have DeAndre Swift. This one makes me a little bit nervous based on like the recent buzz from Bo Wolf, who's on the athletic football show and said like the Eagles want, they want DeAndre Swift to be the lead back of this team. That's what they're hoping for. But Bo also said that uh, Kenny Gainwell, he predicts to lead the, the team in snaps and, and get the most playing time because he's the most reliable guy. Swift has an injury history. I think he's a little bit of an overrated player in general. We're talking, we're, we're hoping he gets targets. Yo, if you're Jalen Hurts, you're not throwing to DeAndre Swift. That's my biggest problem here. And and Kenny right. Gainwell is still going to play in the pass game. Like if your reads are AJ Brown, Devonta Smith, Dallas Goddard, and you're Jalen Hurts, who's the one of the best rushing quarterbacks in the NFL, you're not getting to the you're not getting to the DeAndre Swift progression there unless it's design stuff. And I I just don't think that that's going to happen a ton with this offense. So for me, I think Swift can beat this ADP, but he's a, this is a backfield I'm generally avoiding now that Kenny Gainwell has been 
too steamed up. Uh, all right, round eight for you, Dan Titus. Who are you avoiding? Brian Robinson. Now, I, I love the story of Brian Robinson when he came out to 50 Cent Many Men. That was like one of the dopest things of the fantasy <laughs> season last year. Um, but I just I just question the role right now. And Eric Bieniemy is there. Um, he likes these scat backs. He loves throwing to the to the uh, to the the running backs. And I think Antonio Gibson right now is going is going later in drafts. And um, I think he's going to end up being the better running back this year. So Brian Robinson, I think he's going to be the short yardage guy. He's going to get those high leverage situations. But uh, outside of that, you know, we're pretty much looking like a TD dependent running back. And at that point, I think it's good insurance, but I'm not someone that I'm going to invest in an RB2 value uh, round eight. Uh, I'll pass. I actually kind of like Brian Robinson at 34, but I have him ranked in line with ADP, so I'm not going to fight you too bad on that one. The guy that I picked in the eighth round was David Njoku, Brown's tight end, who goes off the board as tight end 10. Eighth round, eighth pick in the eighth round, uh, 92nd overall. Uh, Yeah, here's the deal, man. I mean, I got the same questions with you about Deshaun, uh, and I think if Deshaun hits, that means a big season is coming for Amari Cooper. I think a bounce back season is coming for Elijah Moore, who I'm a big fan of. I just think like the role that David Njoku had last year as the clear second receiver in that offense is not going to be replicated this year with the way they're going to play offense. So for me, I don't mind David Njoku, but he goes like I'm never taking him in the eighth round. I like no. uh, Evan Ingram better than him. I like Chig Okonkwo better than him. I like Dalton Kincaid better than him. And Tyler Higby has a much safer. I mean, I don't like there's nothing exciting about clicking Tyler Higby, but he's probably going to score <laughs> more fantasy points than David Njoku. Rounds nine and ten. We have the same player. Talk to me about round nine, Michael Thomas. We both agree was our least favorite pick in the ninth round. Man, Michael Thomas, just don't get fooled. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I get it. He's back in practice. He's looking good off that ankle surgery. But, like, I don't know, man. You can't get right, Mike, is, is, is what I feel like he is right Oof. now. And I don't, I don't know that I can trust him, man. I just can't trust him. And to spend that in the ninth round, like, sure, you know, you're in the ninth round. You're going for some dart throws and some upside. But... I think his best days are behind him. And at this point, Chris Olave is the real wide receiver that you want to roster in fantasy. And Jawan Johnson has emerged into this great touchdown. I think that that leaves less involvement for Mike Thomas, who I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah, Rashid, <laughs> Rashid Chai too, man. Like, I, I don't know. I just feel like Mike is just playing on borrowed time at this point. And uh, it'd be nice to see him in the fold. Are the Saints going to be anything? I don't know, but I won't be drafting Michael Thomas this year. Yeah, NOLA.com, Jeff Duncan uh, reported that Michael Thomas is not the Michael Thomas of 2019 and the Saints might not need him to be. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, it, that's true from a team construction perspective. I, I just want Michael Thomas to play so that there's another viable option uh, out there. I like Rashid Shahid. I like uh, A.T. Perry, but these guys are kind of like deeper sleepers. Sure. But I don't want Michael Thomas in, in fantasy. I want him out there just to like give defenses something else to think about besides Chris Olave. Um, <laughs> yeah. with, with Michael Thomas here, man, it just, yeah, there's there's... I, I just don't see a lot of upside at wide receiver 41. For me, he uh, fits in at wide receiver 55. So he's not a guy that I'm clicking there. Uh, just again, I think this world is going to revolve around Chris Olave going mm -hmm. forward. And, and I'm very excited about living in that world. So just not a guy. And again, if he's out by if he's out for the season by week two, you knew what was coming to you. That, exactly. That's even besides the point. So You're right. Right. Another guy that this would probably make sense for a currently injured player. We both listed Kadarius Tony round 10 um i i i love uh the fact that he's going here in round 10 dude because i wasn't even taking him in round seven when he was not <laughs> injured now he's injured and we both got him here at round 10 our least favorite pick in round 10 okay so you lay out the case against Kadarius tony because again if people have been listening to the podcast they know where i stand on this one yeah the thing about tony was i was really between him and rashad penny uh for much of the stuff you we were talking about deandre swift it seems like penny could be a cut candidate so I was like, ah, but I feel like Tony's a person I haven't drafted at all, and I don't intend to because there's just so many options. And if you saw the last preseason game with the with the Kansas City Chiefs, Mahomes threw to like eight different guys. And who's going to emerge as that wide receiver? I don't think it's going to be Kadarius Tony. He can't stay healthy, and Sky Moore is only going a couple picks before him. I'd much rather yeah. have Sky Moore. I'd be willing to draft Rasheed Rice over him. I, I just think there's not a lot. It's just hard to predict who's going to be the next guy up that's not Travis Kelsey. And I'm not willing to invest in the injury prone guy to, to be that, to be him, and especially not in the 10th round. If he falls late in the drafts and you want to take a flyer late, cool. Take Kadarius Tony. He could be the home run that takes you to the fantasy championship. 
but I'm not banking on it. Dude's probably going to be hurt by week three. And even if he's out there, Manny, we just have seen no evidence that he is this stuff that like, I think people are like, oh, the Chiefs talking about him as their wide receiver one. I think people read into those quotes a little a little too much. I mean, he's a, he's clearly a valuable player in the right role, but the right sure. role is not number one receiver. We have no we have no evidence for him. He, yeah, he's he's a gadget guy and he's really good and valuable to the Chiefs in that gadget role. But like, mm-hmm. that's not a fantasy no. viable role. And like people bring up his targets per route run. Go watch like. The guys who are also up there in those high target per route run numbers and see the type of targets they're getting versus the type of targets Kadarius Tony is getting. It's just not it's not real receiver stuff, basically. So for me, yeah, I'm not taking a guy who is currently injured, might start the year on IR. And even when he's back there, the, the return that you're getting is questionable. I really like Sky yeah. Moore going off the board at wide receiver 46. Kadarius Tony right there at wide receiver 48. He's got to fall much later than that and probably not even in a redraft managed league am i am i considering him uh there okay so let's run through rapid fire our rounds 11 through 13 you have your least favorite pick in round 11 is greg dulcich you have damian harris in round 12 and round 13 kyler murray um we talked a lot about greg dulcich and and i think it's pretty reasonable why that one's probably not so great but again explain these guys rapid fire which one you think is like you have most conviction on yeah, Dolchich, I think I'm just concerned that Adam Troutman is actually a thing now. He's coming back with Sean Payton. He seems to like him. Not not as involved in the offense in the preseason that we've seen. I was very high on him, like what he did last season, but his role just might be different, and which which, I, which is why I won't want to draft him in the 11th round. Uh, round 12, Damian Harris. Ah, this was a tough one to get. It's not that I'm completely out on him. I think he's solid insurance for James Cook. We'll see what his workload looks like, but he's already hurt. That's the concern, right? And also Josh Allen is the goal line back there. So uh, I don't know what, how much he's going to be involved just yet. It sounds like they're pretty committed to James Cook. So Damian Harris, I get it. But um, I was really just struggling to find someone in the 12th round, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah. I don't so, have a so lot I'm of like, shares of him, but. I, he, I'm with a, you. Honestly, I have, to spoiler alert, I have Damian Harris too. Like these, this is a pretty, I wrote non-offensive round when you're looking at the <laughs> yeah. ADP source. We're literally, right. Like Tyler yeah. Algier, Chago Quanquo, Derek Carr. Like I'm not going to sit here and tell you the worst pick in this round is Derek Carr. Like, right. That's not useful. Not useful. <laughs> He's going off the board of freaking QB 19. Who cares? <laughs> Jeff Wilson, Raheem Mostert, Adam Thielen, Damian Harris, Gerald Everett, Brock Purdy, Jawan Johnson, Romeo Dobbs, Kenny Pickett. Like I'm not going to come on here and be like, uh, yo, these guys are just, uh, th- these quarterbacks are not there. It's fine. Okay. So right. yeah, Damien Harris, again, he's, he's just like the worst one of a, of fi- a whatever bunch. Exactly. And then Kyler for round 13, I have serious questions about what the Arizona Cardinals season is going to look like. He may not be ready. It sounds like he's not going to be ready. It's going to be Colt McCoy. If they start out bad, what incentive do they have to bring back Kyler earlier? And at that point, I mean, I guess if you decide to win on quarterback and maybe you draft like a Derek Carr or something like that, maybe he could be a guy that you stash on IL and you bring in later in the season. But how can you really get excited about the Arizona Cardinals offense yeah. at all? Yeah, I think Kyler's just a pass. I just don't, I don't even think he's draftable um, in redraft leagues right now. So don't don't. I'd rather take a high upside skill position over Kyler Murray there. Yeah, because biggest part about him from a fantasy angle is the rushing ability. Is he going to be running the same off that ACL tear? You mentioned yeah. the offensive change. I think the offensive change in a hypothetical world where he's <laughs> actually part probably, of the team for a while. Yeah. It's probably good, right? Yeah. It's probably <laughs> yeah. good for the long term, but <laughs> yeah. it, again, it's a lot to ask for him to come off an ACL and get like integrated. Um, I like Marquise Brown. I like Marquise Brown better, better than Jerry Judy. That's probably a take nobody wants to hear, but I like Marquise <laughs> Brown better than Jerry Judy in fantasy this year. Um, Colt McCoy, Russell Wilson, who's better? No, but uh, seriously, I think uh, when when you look at the Cardinals offense overall, I mean, I, I think what's a more interesting question with them is if Kyler is hurt and they're like one in seven, are they bringing him back? If they auctioned off like Kyler Murray on the trade block or uh, the number one overall pick on the trade block, which would they like? I think they'd get way more for the first overall pick than Kyler Murray in his contract. Sure. So I'm with you in a redraft league. I am not taking Kyler Murray in a super flex league. I think if you want to get spicy and take him as your QB three, I think that's fine. But in a redraft managed league, there's really no reason to take him in the totally 13th agree. round. All right. My rounds 11 to 13 guys. Number one, round 11, Jamison Williams. James Williams goes off the board wide receiver 55, uh, the 11th pick in the 11th round. And I think you're just lighting a pick on fire with that one, honestly, because <laughs> even if he's even if he is good in the back half of the season, you have to wait six weeks is forever in fantasy. 
Like I would be willing to hold. I'd, I'd actually, this isn't, we don't have time to do it, but this is an interesting exercise. Like go through the wide receiver rankings and what's the cutoff for a guy that you wouldn't wait six weeks for. Like right. I love Brandon. Ayuk as my wide receiver 21, but am I waiting six weeks for Brandon? Ayuk? Pro- probably, probably not, which is a Dude, bummer. Cause I love Ayuk. Six weeks in a head to head league. Like you don't have time to be waiting for this guy to come off. Like you're just going to go on a, a surge to, to the second half of this, of the fantasy football season with Jameson. Like, no, you're right. Just, don't waste your pick. And, yeah, and uh, and dude, I feel so bad. I said that about Ayuk. I mean, my God, I could have at least said like, <laughs> you put it in the same breath of Jamison Williams. Wow, and that's that's the thing. We have no idea if Jamison Williams is even going to be as good as Brandon Ayuk, who I I think is like a legit superstar yeah. uh, individual player. But other people would think he's just like a fine receiver. We have no idea if James Williams is even going to be a fine receiver. And Scott has brought it up before. You know, week seven, the first game back, you'd probably need to prove it week anyways, and they play the Baltimore Ravens. You're not starting James Williams against Baltimore <laughs> Ravens. And then you might if what if he runs like 12 routes in that game, getting his feet wet? Are you going to play him at week eight against the Las Vegas Raiders? Great matchup. But he ran tw- in a hypothetical world, ran 12 routes week four. No. And then they got to buy in week nine. So you might get to week 10. You haven't felt good about playing James Williams yet. It's tough. He might be Just the worst draft pick in all fantasy. That, uh, he's he probably is even. And this, again, that is even if. He is a great player. He still might right. be the worst draft pick in fantasy because we don't know if he's a great player. So yeah. it, it's just tough. The worst pick you could probably make right now. Just let somebody else pick him. If you're a Jameson truther, let somebody else pick him up and 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 they get, they're totally going to drop him for like <laughs> insert hot waiver wire running back and then you pick him up then. Uh, right. I also have Damian Harris in round 12 and it's basically just I liked him a lot when he signed there, but the injury concern is real. I bet Latavius Murray makes that roster now. Yep. They're going to be just fighting for those two roles. There's a chance. I think Harris might even start the year on IR, a slim chance, but there is a chance. And I think James Cook has just run away with that backfield job at this point that there's probably no standalone value for Damian Harris. And then round 13, DJ Chark. Dude, the Panthers offense, that, that mm. offensive line was part of the reason I liked Bryce Young landing there because like, oh, that's a good offensive line. Icky Aquanu has really struggled in preseason. That's tough. I'm not, I think like they're not going to, no receiver is going to be supported here really in fantasy, but like the vertical X receiver who doesn't beat man coverage, DJ Chark is definitely not. So again, DJ Chark, look, is he going to kill you as the wide receiver 60, 152nd player off the board? No, but I, they're just much better upside darts to throw late in the draft. Yeah, I think the one pass catcher that I do have a couple of shares on really late is Hayden Hurst, just because I, I think that he's going to have, he's, Looked good in the preseason, uh, played all the snaps with Bryce Young. So um, he's going to be a safety blanket. And Adam Thielen, I don't know if he'll stay healthy. Uh, they already have injuries with Terrence Marshall. So, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. That that offense isn't going to look good either way. Um, back end of the draft, uh, my final three, Dawson Knox, uh, the Dalton Kincaid steam is is certainly that, – that train is moving. It looks like they're going to utilize him. Um, as a mismatch, kind of like in a Travis Kelsey role of the, the Kansas City tre- of the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, so I think that's just going to devalue Dawson Knox a little bit more. Definitely going to have some uh, TD regression there. And then round 15, Ryan Tannehill. No surprise there. I'm out on pretty much all the Tennessee Titans. Uh, have no interest in drafting them. And Ryan Tannehill is probably not going to be drafted in a redraft league anyway. And then round 16, another one that I kind of struggle with, Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Uh, uh, there's just so many wide receivers for the Chiefs that uh, why bother? I mean, maybe he's a waiver guy that you pick up on a bye week or something like that, or if he pops off for a couple of good weeks. But there's just so many mouths to feed with the Kansas City Chiefs, and uh, no no reason to draft him. Um, I think he is what he is, and, and we know that. I don't think anything's going to change his outlook or his role going into this season. Yeah, I've got Irv Smith. Just no upside with Irv Smith. Like if you're taking a late tight end, don't you know? Don't bother round fourteen, Irv Smith. I think Hayden Hurst probably outscores him. Jake Ferguson outscores him. Like Luke Musgrave, Sam Laporta would rather take those guys. Um, Rondale Moore again, a guy that's not even going to play in two receiver sets for the Arizona Cardinals is an undraftable player in round fifteen. No thanks. Michael Wilson's probably going to score more fantasy points than him, and he is like le- legit free of free players right now. And Hunter Henry round sixteen, yeah, that's again there are just better tight end bets to make than Hunter Henry in round sixteen. All right, Dan, we did it. We did it. We did it. We did it. <laughs> we 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 trashed a bunch of. Uh, 
players who are way better at football than we are potentially at anything. So uh, that's that's a tough break. But hey, here we are. Uh, no, these are, again, our least favorite picks in each round. The guys that we are drafting around. Uh, Dan, appreciate you doing this one and, and appreciate you jumping on conviction weeks. Yeah. Conviction week here with the with the, the hardest episode to do. Yeah, I appreciate it, Matt. And this is awesome. And apparently Dan Tyus hates running backs. But yeah, that is kind of my strategy in the early rounds, man. Get those wide receivers because I think that they're going to be more valuable and less risk uh, for your fantasy team. So, um, yeah, man, that's that's my uh, that's that's my uh, thing. And I'm sticking to it, man. I don't know. Just fade those contract dudes. You got to do it. Yeah, I'm with you. Hey, listen, we can end on a, a note of total agreement in being very wide receiver heavy. That is obviously uh, the way I like to play the game as well. Well, hey, Dan is going to be doing fantasy work for us all year long. So make sure you tune into that. This will not be the last time that you hear Dan Titus on the podcast. But for now, that is going to do it for us. Listen, if it's a social media app, Yahoo Fantasy is there at Yahoo Fantasy on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Matt Harmon underscore BYB. You could follow Dan at Dan Titus. Please make sure you do that. And you can watch this very show and see me cringe as I say bad things about Keenan Allen on YouTube at Yahoo Sports. Tomorrow, we continue Convictions Week with Fantasy Life's Kendall Valenzuela joining the pod to identify potential breakout candidates in this year's draft. Much more fun to talk breakout candidates and disappointments. Until then, we're out. <laughs>